box, this value propositions box, last time. This time we're over here, the second large box here. And it's big because it's important. It's one of the most important boxes on this business model canvas. And so, what's a, what is a customer? Who's a customer? So it's anyone standing between you and their money. So it could be the buyer, it could be the user, it could be resellers, manufacturers, distributors, essentially anyone standing between you and profit. And as you'll find out, some of you, especially those of you who end up having multi-sided markets, some, mar some businesses have a single-sided market, some have multiple markets who have multiple different audiences that you're selling to, you might find out that the person that's using the thing may not actually be the person that's buying the thing. And so we'll kind of we'll be able to get into that sort of information here in a little bit. So customer segments, we keep talking about customer segments. Well, what is a customer segment? And we've covered this a little bit so far, but it's the it's the portion of that total market that you're focusing on right now. So you know, we, we talked about the first day on Monday that, you know, people are like, yeah, I'm going to sell to the entire world. Well, you're not going to sell to the entire world. Nobody does that. You know, maybe there's one or two just enormous multinational companies that do that, like Coca-Cola or, or Google or that sort of thing. But you're probably not Coca-Cola or Google at this point. So you're not selling to the entire world. You're selling to um, a small segment of that local population, and then you're growing from there. So your market is not everyone. That's not a thing. It's a certain segment of people. It's, you know, maybe it's um, women between the ages of 30 and 60. Maybe it's children. Maybe it's um, men who have uh, a middle income. You'll find that out through your customer discovery. And so I know we had a, we, I talked with a couple people during office hours yesterday about this. So this is kind of how you can visualize your total market, the entire world and then a slightly smaller chunk of that, maybe the entirety of Uganda or the entirety of Africa. And then that smallest segment is the amount that you really should be targeting or that you were able to target as maybe a, a one or two or three person business. So the definitions here, this total available market, so that is the everyone. That's everyone that possibly could use your product or your service anywhere in the country or the world, however large you want to make that biggest the serviceable addressable market, SAM, so that's that smaller group, that's that's a more realistic, maybe that's a long-term, 20, 30-year goal to get to that serviceable available market. So that could be if, you're, if your TAM is the entire world or the entire continent, maybe that SAM is just Uganda. Then you get down to the smallest, this SOM, sometimes it's listed as TM, target market. Um, I, People use different terms, but they mean the same thing. Or this SOM, serviceable attainable market. That is who you're selling to. That's that maybe uh, five percent of the population that will come to you at the beginning of whatever your customer segment is. If maybe it's uh, those middle-aged women, or it's uh, men who work in offices, or that sort of thing. So this is an excellent way to kind of visualize what you're working on versus maybe your eventual goals. Maybe you want your business to eventually get to that SAM or you know maybe it could get to TAM at some point. Yes. Can I give an example? Yes. Just to make it simpler? Yes. So for example, uh, one of the things I do is I make so many t shirts for our city. The, the possible number of people who could buy a souvenir t shirt is endless. In the whole world there are people who buy souvenir t shirts. But I cannot possibly reach everyone. I cannot reach all those people. What is the market that I could possibly reach? And for now, it is within Uganda. That becomes my serviceable, available market. That is the market that I can't reach. I could possibly reach. But that does not mean that I can still reach all of those people, all of the people in Uganda. One, the limitation of resources. The other is the access to those different markets, the distribution networks, and things like that. So then that brings it all down to your target market. Who can you realistically reach with your current resources? 
where you are currently at your school category. So for me, it is mostly the Kampala and the Rua market. That is my target market because of the guys are this rich. And that can even, the target market can even be boiled down further because not everyone wears t shirts. Right? We have, we have to know. Not everyone wears t shirts. Some people, uh, it's mostly a certain range, a certain age range that likes to wear t shirts. So I, I keep bringing it down until I know who is exactly my customer. And then once I know who my customer is, then I can tailor all I do to get it back. Thank you. And so, you know, what, like we were just saying, how do you determine what your TAM, your SAM, your song are? This is through the customer discovery process. It's figuring out and narrowing down who that potential customer is that you should be targeting. All right, we're gonna dive into the activity. Um, so, if you have your value proposition canvas, could you take that out? Everyone should have hung on to that from last time. And your value proposition head. So those two sheets. And so, just kind of a rough idea, figuring out what your total available market is, your serviceable available market, your SAM, and your SOM. What would you consider those categories for your business? And then second, think about whether this is different than maybe you originally thought, when you were originally thinking, you know, you know, who am I targeting? Because there are a lot of folks that came in and was like, oh, I'm targeting everyone. Everyone needs to do this thing, or everyone needs to buy this thing. Has that changed? So we're gonna take about five minutes, let everyone think about that. You can talk to your neighbors and uh, really kind of pinpoint what those three categories are for your business. And I might add that it's different for businesses that serve individuals and businesses that serve business. That's right. So your total addressable market for business that serves businesses, so looking at that particular market, how many people exist in that market that you can sell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Robert Anderman. I, I always don't want to go fast. I want, I want to always go last. But sometimes it's good to go fast. You end up learning, you add more points to what you are failed to do. Uh, my company is Remote Global Solution. That's the one we are taking here. Uh, though we operate in uh, three regions of Uganda, uh, specifically I'm going to look at uh, on the West Nile. Though the other regions, our target market, we are servicing 15% uh, and then 11 respectively. Arua, we are just new, we are babies. I'm going to start from our target. Okay, the, sub, the available market uh, is West Nile region. Uh, in, in which we only look at uh, Akwach district, Nebi, Koboko, Arua, and Yumbe. So those are five districts. The target market, uh, the total available market, we are taking 100% in our service. Uh, that is the entire in those five districts. Uh, the service available market is uh, 53% in the five districts for our business. Uh, our target market is 8% uh, of the market was service. So we hope by the time we reach somewhere, we are going closer to 53, as 53 goes closer to 75. Thank you. Good job. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Aiko Ben Emanuel. Operator and I on events. Are the figures here for academic purposes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't even break them down the percentages. I'll give them as well as they are. Um, the very interesting bit is has this changed since the last session? Yes, what I had in mind has really changed. But I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, my term is. I uh, had a dream for East Africa because we have had others in Congo and Sudan. And uh, the general population, okay, the estimated population we're looking at is between 150 to 180 million. Those new countries have been added to East Africa. Then some has already down to Uganda, an estimation of around 40 million people. 
and then the TM and SOM, West Nile. I put it at 2 million, but actually looking at Tarua City, around 500,000 people, and if you look at the other population, I wrote it down to 5,000. Those are the ones that you can easily reach through the media. So that is And then the service available market, uh, estimates say we have 1.7 million smallholder farmers in West Nile. So that's the service available market for us as a company. And uh, we're looking at smallholder farmers, and then the NGOs working directly with farmers, and then the local governments that are working with farmers. So these are markets available for us as a business. And then with our target market, we also look at the smallholder farmers, of course, in the northern region and some parts of Congo, because from experience, we have, we have been contacted by farmers from uh, Morocco and some people in Congo, and they give testimonies to go to you through internet, the pages that you have, and they come to us here. And then we're also looking at the non-government organizations still. Those are our target markets that are working directly with farmers enhance their livelihoods, and then the local governments in the entire northern region, this is our target market. So as a company, we have percentages big, but for this purpose, I think we're going to stop at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. My name is Matajo Franco, and uh, I'm the founder of Three Road Three Stores. Uh, we, we do have our new Uh, my my term, uh, I would say, will be East Africa. At the start of our business, uh, we started making uh, uh, products of South Sudan, because we know that Sudan is here. Then uh, we made for Kenya, apparel for, with their national flag, uh, also made for Congo, our neighboring country. They all sold. But when right now we focus, we narrowed down on um, West Nile. That now brings me to my to my my sum, which is Uganda. The focus came to Uganda, and uh, with West Nile people in mind. So we have West Nile people across Uganda. Uh, we look at uh, trying to reach these people, as much as you know, you cannot reach all of them. Then my target market, I will say, is West Nile itself. Uh, basing on the terms we have operated, we have been able to reach the entire you know, West Nile. Not everyone, but those 
people were touched by what we do and we, we deliver them. I, I cannot be in position to give figures. That's where I was taking to learn together. But I think uh, I've just broken how my calm, sum and TM will be. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Eve Okorumo, Daitio Company Limited. We make custom outfits. Uh, our target market is Uganda and the US, specifically Minnesota. Whoa. Whoa. Um, our what size available market is West Nile. And our target market is Arua. Because sometimes we get people who order and we send, like maybe every half a year, send to the US. Sometimes in Kenya, but I'm not looking at East Africa, Uganda, Minnesota. Sizable market, West Nile. Target, Arua and Kampala. Very nice. Good evening. This is Director Lens. Okay. Yes. One of our products is the sifting. So our total available market is Uganda. Then the serviceable available market is Northern Uganda. Okay. Because. If we take Uganda as a whole, <coughs> we may not be able to supply seedlings up to Western Uganda or Eastern Uganda. But Northern Uganda we can serve. Furthermore, our target market is the agricultural farmers in West Nile. Very specific. Okay? Not all seedlings. There are other people who are doing seedlings for eucalyptus, for guavas. But our target market is the horticultural farmers. Now there are farmers who are going to be startup farmers, who are going to start for the first time in their lives. That is our target. Then there are farmers who have been doing Portugal, but they have been failing to raise seedlings. That is our target also. Now, there are organizations that are going to deal with farmers, support farmers in horticultural production. They will need ready seedlings because they have a limited time frame for their projects. So when they have donors coming, they need ready seedlings. Now, that's just our work. Thank you. Good job. This is Good evening. Yes, this is Nancy. My is name is Ginat. Yes, so um, as um, from the beginning, I was Salt, but not really that salt in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, as salt, um, I already shared on uh, what we do and uh, some of the products. We have a uh, let me say a number of services. <coughs> That's, uh, when is the another bronze, but also do skilling at the same time. Of course, uh, when you look at total available markets, our total available markets are in, uh, let me say, Uganda and South Sudan. Because we have salt in Arua, which is in Uganda, and also salt in Yen. So we are serving almost the same target for the same market. We feel it is available. When we are looking at single mothers, those are our target markets. The single mothers, we have the youth, have the business women and men around and of course we are looking at the refugees because also they benefit from some of our services whether directly or indirectly 
so they are also our target our market. Um, well, the serviceable available market we're looking at uh, West Nile, and of course, uh, we would wish to um, have our services or products spread in almost all the districts within West Nile, so that um, we're able to skill, we're able to give knowledge. We are supposed to also do spiritual nourishment because. Many people run away from that, but it's necessary. <laughs> yes. So people, many people run away from that, but it's very necessary. So I think of them that you should know as a service for the market. All of you here, even you can start nourishing answers from <laughs> Yeah, amen. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so you see, that is also something very important because uh, the youth are the ones who can be brought easily into these services. The women, so some of the men are rich, but you can also bring them in into these services. When you look at um, the number of boys and girls in homes, some of them are not being exposed because the fathers have put very tight security for their children. That makes them not come out easily. So we look at a very centralized place for the youth able to be skilled, to be able to be exposed. If we, they are not given opportunity, they are not asked. Yes, that is what I'm going to talk about. Okay, we just need numbers. numbers. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> yes. My name is Edward Nath. I work for African Supply Institute. We make a little genetics. We sell our agro inputs. We do extension services for the farmers and the uh, farmers market. Uh, here, our total. Total addressable market. We target Uganda. In Uganda, we target any farmer, NGO, schools, local government, who do farming. Then our that, that one can be around 40 percent. Then coming to serviceable available market, we target West Nile. So here we we know. Uh, trying to be specific on commercial farmers and small scale farmers. So either being in the local government, district, uh, or local local government, NGOs, and schools. So we target those things. Uh, can be around the 30%. Then coming to target market. Specific dimension here, Rua, and in the Rua here, we, we further target small older farmers, especially in the villages, most areas, and there we also target some specific groups like female, uh, women and youth. So, our percentage for the target market. And they're around 15 percent. And if we do this one, then it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. To really hone in on this, and some people are really starting to, to grasp what your true SOM or your target market is, you're going to really figure this out doing customer discovery. So, the customer discovery process is hypothesis driven. So that value proposition uh, canvas that we, that we did on Wednesday, that's the beginning of your hypothesis. That's the thing you're going to test. Yes? Maybe <coughs> to use a simpler word instead of hypothesis, uh, assumption. Assumption. Remember, I used to suffer with the hypothesis testing in my past. <laughs> this is having flashbacks. <laughs> I'm having flashbacks. Yes. So, so on on that sheet, that circle, especially the circle part of that that canvas, 
that is your assumption. That's this is the starting point, and the thing you're either going to you're going to find data that goes along with it, it's going to prove it, or you're going to find data that says nope, this is not exactly what I should be doing. I have a different market that should be going through. So you're going to ask a structured set of questions, and this is in a few slides. This is what we're going to do. We're going to generate the first set of questions that you're going to go, and you're just going to talk to people. I, I had to read the talking to you before. So you're going to go talk to some humans. You're going to find out what the problems are. You're going to find out what they're doing to solve it. And you're not going to be selling your thing. I know that's very difficult for a lot of people, especially when they're first starting out. You just you want to sell your product. You want to sell your service. It's just it's ingrained in you as an entrepreneur. This is the one time where I'm going to say, no, you cannot sell your stuff. If they ask you at the end, what do you do? That's fine. Once you've gotten your data already, you can talk about what you do. But the first thing you're going to do is ask the questions. The other thing is these questions, they can't be yes, no questions. So they can't be the sort of questions where you get either a yes or a no, or just a really short answer. You want something where people can elaborate on the answers. Can I just go back? Yes. Did I not elaborate with an example? Yes. Say I was Say I want to set up a, uh, I want to set up a, uh, a workshop space, right? And I want organizations and so forth to bring that workshop space to us. And I'm doing the customer discovery process. And I want to talk to these people to validate the assumptions I've made about what the customer wants. What I should not do is go and tell them, so, um, we're setting up this place like this. If we did it, would you come to it? <laughs> <laughs> you are already biasing their mind. Biasing their mind. You're not going to launch anything <laughs> when you ask that. A better question would be when you are looking for a workshop space, what do you usually look for? What are the things that you consider we should have? You know? What are the things that you say? This is a perfect workshop space. What does it mean? So you're keeping that question open, and the person is the one giving you the information that will help you to figure out what you do. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Excellent. So when you're conducting these interviews, face to face is always the best. It's the best to be, you'll be able to get both the verbal and their nonverbal uh, kind of body language sort of thing. Um, so as you're writing down their answers to this, because you're going to want to record all these, you know, part of the reason why you've got a notebook, so you have to record these on. Also keep track of, you know, if they're giving you strange looks, if they're kind of shifting around a little bit, if they're acting kind of funny, you know, maybe they've gotten kind of disinterested with these questions. Keep track of that information as well, because that's going to that's gonna help you out as you keep going after a few uh, customer interviews be able to edit some of these questions because some of them just aren't coming across well stop asking them. ask different questions rephrase what you're doing kind of tailor this to what you need so face to face is okay uh, if you need to do a video call that's okay because you're still getting that that visual you're able to see what they're doing if you have to just get them on the phone that's okay too it's not as good as an in-person or a video call because you're not getting that visual those visual cues, they could be just telling you stuff and rolling their eyes and who knows what else at you. But the one thing I do not want you to do, unless you're just using it as a filter to get people to talk to, don't use surveys and questionnaires. What people end up doing with surveys and questionnaires, you get to those yes or no answers or questions. It's like, you know, you know, would you use this? So are you going to do this thing? Well, that's, that's not useful information. It's more of Trying to filter people by whatever group you'd like to talk to. You know, if you fit into a certain category, those are the folks that maybe you can reach out to first. Um, you know, if you're looking for, you know, secondary school students, you know, figure out their age or ask them, you know, what their institution is, that sort of thing. So you can kind of figure out um, that sort of stuff if you wanted to filter them that way. Um, Just make sure you're getting decent, it's called 
qualitative data. So just long form answers from these folks. I always recommend creating five to seven questions because it's, it's long enough to get some good data, but not so long where they just zone out and they just start ignoring you. So five to seven open-ended questions. Open-ended is that thing where they're elaborating on, on their answers. It's not the, the close-ended yes, no, maybe sort of thing. And then just have a conversation. You know, that's why you learned, you read how to talk to humans. Now you actually get to go talk to humans. Just have a conversation with these people. Get these, get the questions in, get things recorded. But it's just a conversation. It's not an interrogation. It's not, you know, you're not cornering people and trying to, you know, like, you know, what do you do? What's your problem? Ah! <laughs> you want to just have a conversation with people. That is a Yeah. No, you know, don't shine a light on them and, you know, big light on people. So um, try to validate or invalidate your assumptions. So that circle on the value proposition canvas that you put down, all that information on Wednesday. What you're trying to do, you're either trying to prove or disprove what you think the customer actually wants out of your business. If you're getting information that's kind of proving it, then obviously you're on the right track. Keep digging a little deeper on that. But if you're getting a lot of data that's completely contradicting what's on in that circle, then it's time to think, maybe I need to pivot. Maybe I have reached an obstacle. I need to figure out a different solution to this. And like I said before, don't sell your stuff. I know everyone wants to sell. Everyone wants to sell what they're making or what they're doing. This is not the time for that. The time for that is if you want to demo something at the very, very end, you can, but make sure you get that information out of it first. And so I know I put try to talk to 100 different people. That's impossible in the next, unless you are some sort of interviewing genius and you talk to hundreds of people a day. I'm not expecting anyone to get to 100. Our, our students in our summer accelerator. We're, we're having trouble over the course of 11 weeks just getting to talk to 50 people. So if you can make it to 100, then I don't know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll come up with a prize or something at the end <laughs> for most customer interviews. Um, but don't, don't just aim for quantity, aim for quality. We want quality interviews so you get the information that you need. Really learn about the problems each person, each person you interview is having and especially what they're trying to do now to solve it. They may not be doing anything to solve their problem right now. They may have cobbled together some ridiculous scheme of four or five different tools in order to do the problem that your tool or one tool actually does. And then as you go along, you, know, you can share what you've learned with your customers. It's okay to, you know, once you've gotten their feedback, to pull back the curtain a little bit, you know, let them know what's going on, tell them a little bit about what you're, this is where you can tell them what you're selling if you want. That provides value to them uh, to really understand that no, you're not just you're not just being some person who's walking around trying to corner people and interrogate them. You actually want to better understand the people who you're selling things to. And like we've said before, ask why as much as you can. This is it's really if you get, you get an answer, maybe they've gone on for a couple minutes, and then see if maybe you can follow up on that, and get a little bit more information. Leave, leave words hanging in the air is what they always tell us when we're doing these things. You know, as people are, you know, they come to the end of the sentence, they kind of nod your head, and sometimes they'll keep going, they'll give you a couple more sentences worth of information. Listen for unexpected things, look for surprises. This is why you need to be taking notes as you're doing these interviews, so you can be underlining, circling, whatever stands out to you. And then at the very end, um, before you start talking about what your solution is, you know, what you're selling, ask them this. What are the top three things you could change about the problem and why? Or about whatever solution they're using and why? That's always helpful at the end. So, do you have anything you want to... So I think the project? whole point of this process is trying to figure out how can I solve my customer better by understanding what their real needs are. So it is not a lot of times as entrepreneurs will come up the, with the idea and say, this is your problem, this is the solution. Finish it. But we have to give the customer the opportunity to tell us what is their problem, 
what may be, in what ways they try to solve it, and then we can then offer them how we are trying to solve it for them. So we first have to learn from them. How do they think it will be? How, how, what would I say? What would they say is a job well done in solving that problem? Once, once it is done for them, if it is shoes, what would what the customer say? Very good service. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Paul Kube Hassan. Uh, I go to a reason why I'm just my That's why I want to compare that I'm trying to present to the other person who that is simple. I, when I first started making good products like these ones, the first products were threaded ones. Why don't you make something a little bit classic in a way that somebody can use to go out outing or to go with it in office? So that's when how I generated out the idea of using leather. And the main emphasis is customers always are very enthusiastic in a way that they need what they need something which is what is important to them. But in the new course of which you keep considering that when giving a product to a customer, you don't choose for them, they choose what they want. Okay, the customer, you understand? They ask, I have clients here who have sold to them both products and they have testified to me that the first one is a good product, but the other one is much more better. And None of my products I started with is out of the ideas of the customers. I'm advising on how to make them. Thank you very much. Okay, now that everyone has, has a beverage, maybe we just have a little food, we're going to kind of dive into this activity here uh, for the next half an hour or so. Um, so the, for about the first half of it, I want you to try to create your first set of questions. Um, and you're going to be talking to people next to you uh, for that part of it, and you definitely need to talk to people next to you for the second half. For the second half of it, you're going to be testing your questions on each other. And so groups of three or four, roughly, will work. No, uh, the, the 21 people, so groups of three. Groups group. of three works, so. Seven groups of three. Yes, so kind of group yourselves accordingly, and you'll take turns. One of you will be asking the questions, the interviewer. One of them, one of you will be answering the questions, the interviewee, and then want well, the third person just to kind of listen and observe and see what sort of body language you know, the interviewee is giving off. And then I may ask. Uh, Yes. What will these questions be in line with what, what business? Does one of them choose it for their business? Yes, everyone does it for their own business. For their own business. Yes, so create your five to seven questions. So yeah, everyone, course. first create your five to seven questions, your customer discovery questions, and then we're going to split in groups, and then we'll switch roles. At one point, one person will be an interviewer, the other an interviewee, the other one a listener. And then you switch roles, and then you switch until everyone has played each of these roles. Either as an interviewer, an interviewee, or a listener. So you're observing how others are doing them, customer this time. Okay? All right, so about 10 to 15 minutes to come up with your questions, and then another 15 to 20 to play all three roles. How do you feel? How do you feel about customer discovery interviews? He's my genius. Yeah? <laughs> Tell me about it. What was your experience like as both a both an interviewer and an interviewee? How did it feel in both of those? Yes. When I was uh, being interviewed, I felt good to pour out my heart. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, I'm like, yeah, I've got an opportunity to tell people what I want. To tell someone what I've been wanting. Yeah. Do you feel like 
How would you feel if your partner's questions were open ended? Not a lot of yes, no. Was a lot of no, there was there were no yes, no. Like Good. they all needed explanation and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then how did you feel, how did you feel when you were <laughs> the interviewers? When you were interviewing yes, when you were interviewing your partner. Especially for my business, I felt challenged. Mm -hmm. I felt like I need to go and paint a good name about tailors. Because we knew what we were going to <laughs> So it was a little bit difficult to get a, the truth out of what we were saying. Sure. Yeah, so we're really biased because we knew. And this is actually something we're going to go into. You know, this is the reason you don't talk to, you know, your spouse or your kids or your parents. You don't talk to family. Because, of course, they're going to tell you your idea is amazing. There's a saying over the U.S. that, that your family's never going to tell you your baby's ugly. But sometimes your baby is ugly. It's strange to be able to tell you that your baby is ugly. It's the only, the only way you're going to get the truth. The only, the only way you're going to get true answers to these questions and find out whether your baby is ugly is to ask strangers. Because they don't know you. They don't care. They don't even know how to stand up. Does anyone else want to share their experience with this? Yes. Yes. Um, as an, inter an interviewer, um, I had a guide that I was using, mm -hmm. but then when I asked the first question, uh, I couldn't ask the other question. So I didn't know why it's yeah, the interview was not like uh, my target customer. Right. So I was asking in a direction where well, he knew someone that. <laughs> That's actually a good tip. If you can get another contact or two when you do these interviews, that'll make your lives a lot easier. Because then you'll have a chain of people you can talk to. So you shouldn't, if you keep getting one or two uh, referrals each time, you should never <coughs> run out of people to talk to. So you can get to that under much faster than you otherwise would if you're just trying to pick one person out of the crowd after another. Anyone who, who played the listener role, how was that? How did that feel, being a listener? <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting people pointing at you. How, how did you feel being a listener? Yeah, I played the Okay. Basically, uh, one, of course, you're going to go out and do this. This was just practice. Go out there and do it. Uh, some of the people that are your customer, uh, that, that's the ones that you want to serve. One of the things that you know, of course, you'll identify some of the first people that uh, are asking for those people, kids. You can ask, who else do you think? Yes. Who care about this? Those are the people who need to be the next person to get customer feedback. So everyone feels ready to go out and start talking to people yeah. this yeah. weekend? Excellent. Because that, that's your homework, is to start these customer discovery interviews with actual 
people in your customer segment. So if you know, if you've identified who your customer segment is, now is the time to maybe start thinking, start brainstorming five to ten people who you want to reach out to in the next few days and start talking to them. Can I something? Yes. Can I consult my former client, my clients? Can I use them as? Yes. Yes. You can. You could start there, but don't just rely on them. You'll want to go out. That's when you're asking the who else do you need to talk to. Okay. And spread out. Actually, what I wanted to comment about for people whose business is already existing, make it a point to have sort of a customer database where you pick as much information as possible about the customers, their telephone number, where they are, and all that. So, part of the <coughs> feedback you will actually seek can sometimes be from the people who have already tested your services or products, in addition to talking to new customers who have, you know, not yet done business with you. Your, your existing customers, since they already have a taste of what you do, are the best to give you feedback on how to improve it. Yeah. yeah, what you're doing. But sometimes also, that is a challenge because they are, in a way, already biased to say, this one is only capable of this. So they do not think of you beyond yeah, a certain level. So that's why you have to reach out to others who have not yet experienced service so they can also give you their perspective. But a lot of us lose this data because we don't deliberately collect it. But it's the data that you need to collect on a daily basis for all your customers. That's the great thing about this. You're gonna you're gonna start keeping a lot more records of these things <coughs> than you probably have up to this point. Especially once and, you and really, when you have this information, when you have this data, when you talk about your business compared to someone who's not been keeping, it's different. You will sound like someone who knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. and people will want to work with you. They want us to improve. Yeah, like sometimes when they tell you to improve, you're like, ah. But yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so now you're at the, all of you are at the point. We've gone over this box. We've now gone over this box. And so you can take one of those 10 copies of that business model canvas that's in your folder. You can start filling these things out. You can start version one of that canvas. With this information that you've learned, so that's that's one of the things I'd like you to do um, before Monday's session as well. So basically, as you're doing the customer discovery, mm -hmm. as you're saying, uh, you have a business model canvas. You uh, want all the boxes. The template of the business model canvas. So the exercise we did yesterday was figuring out value propositions. Customers that you serve in the customer segment. Each customer 
segment corresponds to a value proposition. As each customer segment, there's some value that you're offering to them. Uh, to the customer segment for her, <coughs> smallholder farmers, the value proposition is you're bulking their products, right? Giving them a market for their small uh, product. For the bulk buyer segment, you're offering them bulk. So they can you know, so the value proposition corresponds to the customer segment that you serve. So start filling that in inside that value Monday. Yes. And you have multiple copies of that because it's going to change over the next couple of weeks. But it, you need As to you keep learning, you keep, you keep improving it. Right. Okay. And so do those two things: the interviews. Just try to get a few interviews in. Start filling out the the small canvas in those two boxes, and then on Monday. What we're going to do the first half of the class is everyone's going to get up. Everyone is going to get up and everyone. tell us about what they learned. Yes, <coughs> because this is where we start practicing getting up in front of everyone, <laughs> pouring your heart out. Because on demo day, everyone is going to have to get up and get the presentation. So this is going to be practice. Uh, and another thing, especially for those whose businesses are already running and you're going to interview your customers who already know the line of business. The, how to avoid bias is how you frame the questions. You're, you are not asking them just about your business and your services, but that particular service in general, how it is provided. So you want to learn not just about how you provide it, but how it is generally provided and the customers, uh, ideas or feedback on their frustrations or their the, the, the benefits they get from it. So you want to learn. You're not asking, what can I use on as other example? You say it's a piece. Robert's doing, say, soft loan, something like that. So you're going to ask, not about your particular business. You don't even mention your business name. You're just asking the customer, what has been their experience with soft loans in general? So you want their general experience and their feedback and that that widen the amount of information they can give. Don't make it specific.